So once again, we have the alkyl groups. Then we have those that are containing oxygens. I've already said this term before, which is carb carbonyl group. Which What is a carbonyl group? Right, it's just the C double bonded to the oxygen. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> now, in organic chemistry, we have it whenever the C is only has one other carbon containing group, it's called the aldehyde. And if it's got two carbon groups hanging over it, then it's called the ketone. But it also has another term which gets used a lot, especially when we talk about fatty acids, but just in general. What is that term? So if a carbonyl, it's also called I actually already said it once. It starts with an A. Acyl. So acylation is when you're adding a carbonyl group to something. Okay. So it's also called an acyl group. That's why they usually say a fatty, fatty acyl, or it, something's been acylated. Unless there's one special exception that's on here. Instead of saying acyl, they say acetyl if it's just two carbons. Because the old <laughs> term, because what's the term that's normally used whenever we're learning all the prefixes for two? You know, it's meth and eth, but the old term is acet. A C E T, and so acetyl still sticks around. Um, acetic acid still sticks around, and those are still commonly used. All right, but then we have our good friend a carboxylate, which is just a carboxylic acid that's lost its hydrogen, and that's because in vivo, almost always that hydrogen's popped off, the acid's lost it, so we'd say a carboxylate. Now there are some exceptions that are really important with hydrogen bonding for for catalysis to occur. And so then we'll say a carboxylic acid. But a carboxylate, this if you remember from gin chem, A-T-E on the ending means it's negatively charged, like sulfate. Um, same thing with ite, sulfite, phosphite, phosphate, um, nitrite, nitrate. Whereas if, if it ends in I-U-M, it's usually a metal or it's positively charged, like ammonia, magnesium, sodium, yada, yada, yada. OK, then we have. Hydroxyl, which is an alcohol group, and so those are used interchangeably. Enol, which is a special type of alcohol, and it's the tautomer, if you remember from organic chemistry, it's the tautomer of the ketone. So it's an alkene with an alcohol hanging off of it, so that's why it's called enol. Then we have two that usually gets mixed up a lot, ether and ester. Ether is R-O-R. -R. The R's could be the same or they could be different. Many times in vivo, they're different. Whereas in, when we're working with them in organic chemistry, we're usually talking about diethyl ether, propyl ether, which is dipropyl ether, things like that. Esters, we're going to see lots and lots of esters. That's an R, carbonyl, O, R group. And then an acetyl group, which we've already talked about, which it doesn't have to be an oxygen here. In vivo, what other atom is used instead of oxygen a lot, which we didn't talk about hardly at all and we didn't use in organic chemistry? Because in vitro, they just don't use it. Sulfur, okay? And there's a reason why sulfur gets used more often in vivo than oxygen, and we'll talk about that whenever that time comes. Okay. So then we have the nitrogen-contained groups. Now, in biochemistry versus, you know, in, bio, in organic, a lot of times we say amine, which it is an amine group, but we also say amino, because that O just means it's attached to something else. Just like YL means it's attached, like a... Like fluoro carbon and fluorine is attached to a carbon, or um, a hydroxyl group is something that's attached, you know, an alcohol is attached to something. So YL and O just usually means it's an attachment. Same thing with amide versus amido, they're used interchangeably. This is one that we talked a little bit about in organic chemistry, but not a lot, and that's an imine. It gets used a lot in, or in biochemistry and in vivo. And looks looks just like a carbonyl or an acyl group, except it's a nitrogen instead of an oxygen. But once again, the nitrogen has to make at least three to four bonds. If it's only got three bonds, it means it's got lone pair electrons. If it's got four bonds, that means it's protonated, unless it's a permanent cation, which um, would be very rarely used in vivo. Okay. Now there's a special one called an N-substituted imine. That's when it's making three bonds, but instead of a hydrogen, it's got another carbon on it. But they almost always call it a shift base, which whenever I was taking biochemistry, no one spelled it out. 
four minutes. So I thought forever that the guy was talking about shift phase, but shift, that was the guy's last name. And we're going to find out that this is very, very, very important. And there's one amino acid in particular that uses this over and over and over again. If you see it and it's used in catalysis almost always, it's because it's forming a shift phase. If you started learning your amino acids already, does anyone know? Has anyone started? What, what amino acid do you suppose makes shift phases all the time? It's the only one that ends in amine. It's lysine. So L-Y-S. S? S. <clears throat> then we have imidazole. Right, I'm skipping guanidinium right now. We have imidazole, which whenever I draw it, because I like baseball, uh, to me it looks like home plate whenever they draw it a certain way. It looks like this if you draw it out. Double bond, nitrogen, nitrogen, carbon. It's another double bond. <clears throat> That's an imidazole group. And there's one amino acid that looks like imidazole. In fact, it has an imidazole group hanging off of it. And that's histidine, and it's very, very important because imidazole groups have a special chemistry to them that's unlike anything else. And that's because, if you notice, this one nitrogen has a hydrogen on it. And so this double bond can switch from side to side. So that's, it's aromatic. If you've already had organic chemistry too, you know what that means. But it actually can switch, and so that's why it can be attacked on one side and donate a hydrogen on the other. And then it goes backwards. And so it's used a lot in what's called dental acid base chemistry, where it can donate a proton and accept a proton at the same time. Because as one comes in, the other one leaves. So it's really interesting in chemistry, chemistry wise. Then we have one adenium, which looks scary, but it's not that bad because it's the way that they have drawn here, I think, makes it look wor worse. Whereas if you draw it like you do in organic chemistry, we have a nitrogen. The carbon, nitrogen, and instead of an acyl group, it's a double bonded nitrogen. It's a strong base. Arginine it has a guanidinium group on it. Okay. And it usually has a positive charge. So there's actually resonance between these two nitrogens. So you draw it out like that, but in reality, those two terminal nitrogens are equivalent to each other. So there's resonance between them. So that's why you can easily accept an extra hydrogen, which comes important when you're learning in chapter three, the amino acids. Then we have sulfur and phosphate. Now, this is the other big difference between organic and biochemistry, and I'll almost always use the term thiol. And even in a lot of the biochemistry tests, the texts, they'll say thiol, because it's an alcohol, the thi, T-H-I, indicates a, a, a sulfur. And so it's also called sulfhydryl. Once in a while you'll hear about a mercapto group, because that's the really old term for an SH. But sulfhydryl is pretty easy, sulfur with the hydrogen, and a thiol. And then a disulfide. What's so special about disulfides? Does anyone remember from, you may talk about it a little bit between, um, it's important in biology and genetics in particular. What's important about disulfides? How do you get them? It's when two thiols come together. And so they're used, actually in vivo, it's used for one type of reaction all the time. In fact, without it, you would die. That's redox reactions. Because you know, in organic chemistry, you always talk about redox reactions using oxygen. You know, go from alcohol to a you know, to an a carbon, carbonyl group, to carboxylic acid, ultimately to carbon dioxide. And we do that in vivo as well, but we have to have something else that helps keep everything in the right oxidation state, especially when your proteins are folding and there's something called glutathione, and it's essentially just a really small, tiny pep peptide that has a cysteine, which cysteine is the one that ends in a thiol group, and these cysteines can form disulfides with each other, and so they help proteins fold correctly and keep the right oxidation state. Plus, disulfide bonding is important for protein structure because sometimes it deliberately forms disulfide bonds between two cysteines that are far away from each other in the space along the, the peptide chain, but they can come together, connect, so like a Lego block, I guess, and, um, and form a little link, like snap together to form a disulfide bond. Thioester is just like an ester except it's with the sulfur. 
Now, carbons do not form double bonds with sulfurs. You know, they do with nitrogens, but they don't with sulfurs. Okay. Sulfur just don't, doesn't do that. Sulfur can form a double bond with an oxygen, but not with a carbon. <coughs> and I'm not an inorganic chemist, so I couldn't explain that, the rationale between why. Then we have the phosphoryl group which they'll also call this a phosphate if you add the extra oxygen. And so phosphoryl, because whenever it's free, it's, na it's, well, it's got two negative charge actually, whenever it's free, and so it's a phosphate. And phosphoanhydride is just like an acid anhydride or a carbo uh, carbon anhydride, except it's got phos phosphates. <coughs> and then you have a mixed, which is a mixture between a carboxylic acid anhydride and a phosphoryl anhydride. <clears throat> so if we just look at this, this is ATP. Well, I'm going to do ATP first before we get to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. <clears throat> so if we look at ATP, what's one of the functional groups hanging off of ATP or that's a part of ATP? There's the phosphate or the phosphorols. And you can also say that this is, what else could you call this one? The phosphoric anhydride. So that's why they kind of go hand in hand. What else is there? There's at least one, two, three more that I see. There's the amine. There's the alcohol. What's the other one? Ether. Yep, because this is the R group. What's R, R group? O, R. That's the one that people usually overlook. <clears throat> then we look at dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which has a great, like, hip-hop name that they a lot of times call it, at least that's what it reminds me of, because, you know, I'm just so cool that I'm uncool. Um, does anyone know what they also call it? It's DHAP, <laughs> which doesn't sound like a hip-hop name. It's a DHAB, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. It's very, 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 very important. Next semester, you're going to find out that that's a common metabolite in multiple metabolic pathways, the DHAB. <clears throat> which three carbon units, if you go all the way back to glycerol, which is when it's just three carbons with an alcohol hanging off of each carbon, um, that's so important, building block. And it's in multiple, it and its derivatives, because acetone, and DHAP and, 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 you know, the triacylglycerols, tri triglycerides, your diglycerides, monoglycerides, all those are derivatives of those three carbon containing groups. So that's why you'll see it over and over and over again. But what are some of the functional groups that we see hanging off of DHAP? We have the phosphate of the phosphoryl group. The carbonyl, also called an acyl, also called the ketone, and alcohol. This is not a carboxylic acid. Why is this not a carboxylic acid? What? Because the double bonded, uh, the carbonyl is not directly attached. The carbonyl is not directly attached to the oxygen of the alcohol group. Okay, there's that intervening methylene, that intervening carbon group. And so this is this is acetyl coenzyme A, which is also called acetyl CoA. So, just from its name, what do you know? What's one functional group that, oh, whoops, sorry, I went backwards. Oh, come on. What's one functional group, just from the name? <coughs> acetyl. It's the acetyl group is right here. And you're going to find out that, it's, that coenzyme A, it, it transfers acyl groups or acetyl groups. Okay, that's what we're going to use it a lot next semester. This semester, for most of this semester, you're just talking about the different biomolecules till towards the very end. And then next semester, it's all about the metabolic pathways, how it's used in vivo um, by bacteria. A little bit, we may, I don't know how much we'll get to with plants, but bacteria and, and, and eukaryotes alike. But they've already pointed out the thioesters, the amides, the alcohols, <laughs> phosphoanhydrides. Now, they use that term imidazole-like. I don't, that's kind of hokey, but, yeah, but amino and so on and so forth. 
So I would expect that if I gave you a compound that you'd be able to pick it out, or if I said draw an amide or a methyl group, you'd be able to pick it out, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to briefly, and I mean very, very quickly, talk about, because you take life origins, you take faith integration, talk about you know, the origins of life. Um, oops, here we go. <clears throat> and so briefly, we're going to have the Big Bang Theory. You know, that's the whole matter. It's like a little infinitesimal point, and then boom, and then after long periods of time, it's spread out. Okay, and that since then, at some point in time, it's going to start to contract or things like that, but I don't know, I'm not an astrophysicist, so I couldn't explain it beyond that point. And that ever since then, the temperature's been decreasing, and that in the very, very beginning, they say only the simplest three elements was around, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, and we do know that fusion can, can happen, where you can take you know, two atoms, I don't know how much you're going to gin can two here, but... You take two atoms and you can smack them together to get a bigger atom and then, you know, get, like, neutrons or positrons or things that are, that are released. Okay. And then, and those, that's thermonuclear reactions. The things can explode and yada, yada, yada. Now, one thing there is that, that you can take from here is if you just look in the universe, and I don't know how they get these numbers, but, you know, some theoretical physicist has set down there and figured them up, but if you just use the, a carbon as the, the rule, you know, if you say there's a thousand carbon hydrogens, there's so much more hydrogen available and oxygen available and even nitrogen. And then you see the relative abundance of these other things. However, in vivo, we are enriched in carbon. We are a carbon-based organism. So. But we're going to find out that these other elements are important. You may not have, like, there's another one that's not even on here, molybdenum and vanadium too, for that matter, but you may not have very much in your body, but molybdenum, manganese, magnesium, some of these are very, very important. Okay. We cover that more next semester. Actually, I'm just going to go through, because we actually already talked about this. Okay. So we have these biomolecules, as we talked about them last time. Biomolecules are also called, we call them macromolecules because they're large molecules. And we have, there are four general classes that we talk about, proteins, nucleic acids, polysaccharides, and what's the other one? Lipids. The reason why lipids isn't on here is because of the fact that here we're talking about polymers, which poly means many parts versus monomer. But what's the, what's the monomer of a, what's an example of a lipid? Pardon? Triglycerides. What's another example of a lipid? And don't say diglyceride or monoglyceride. Cholesterol. And so what's the building block of, like, cholesterol versus a triglyceride? Do they have a common building block? Yes and no. Like, they are from different metabolic pathways, and so it's much more, it's much more complex than that. It's not as simple as just saying, okay, we have... Because you're going to find out there's something called an isoprenoid unit that can be used to make the cholesterol. You can ultimately get from cholesterol to triglycerides and things like that, but it's not direct. They are not directly linked. Okay. But they are still the same overall large class of biomolecules. Whereas these other three, they have very distinct common origins. Okay, they are derived from monomers. And so what are the monomers for each of these? What's the monomer for a protein? Amino acid. What's the monomer for DNA and RNA? For the nucleic acids, it's a nucleotide, okay? And for the polysaccharides, what's the monomer for that? Monosaccharide. That one's the easiest. You know, I've had people over, I've put that before on like an exam or quiz. People think, 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 and they don't, they overthink it, I think. Okay, so. <clears throat> and then like cell biology in like two minutes. Because it's one of my least favorite, that was one of my least favorite classes I ever had to take with cell biology. And I think it's because I didn't take it until the University of Michigan Medical School required it. And by that time, I'd already taken all these biochemistry classes. And I think, so I'd already picked it up along the way. And so 
I didn't learn a single new thing in that class. And I think we actually use the same book that you guys that, that's used here, or at least that Dr. Abraham used to use here. But I was just so I was I I actually don't 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 do what I did, and so because it was also that was whenever we had just moved from Duke University, you know, which was sunny and nice and beautiful in North Carolina, to Michigan, and it was that very first semester, and it got cold. You know, the leaves started changing in the end of August and, and into September, and it was cold and nasty. And I was on the, you know, I was in medical school. My lab was located on the main campus, but the cell biology class I had to take was all the way in the medical campus. So you either had to walk, that time was before I was crippled, you either had to walk for like half an hour or you had to take a bus for like half an hour or longer. And so I skipped like two thirds of the classes in cell biology. <laughs> I just duped some girl into taking notes and I would get them from her later. Read the book. Don't do that. And so I, I yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's, Let's go. I hit the wrong button again. Oh, come on now. Here we go. So you can imagine there are different, there's a hierarchy to the cellular biology and the organization and compartmentalization of the cell. Which was another thing on my, on my dissertation committee. I had, uh, no, it was, on, it was on my defense, my pre prelim defense committee there at Michigan. I had put, deliberately I put the, one of the guys that taught cell biology, he was the head of the department at that time, the Department of Biochemistry. And um, he had been like in a rock band in the 1960s, and I think he did a lot of ganja and stuff probably back then because he kind of looked like Tiny Tim, which he, he was a very, very nice guy, but he's very mellow, very groovy. <laughs> So, um, I had, you know, we, if you ever go into medical school or graduate school and you have to do your boards or your defenses, if you get to pick people that are on your committee or you get to pick who doesn't go on your committee, you want to get all the gossip from them. So I said, you know, who's good, who's good? And they said, oh, use Bob. I won't say his last name. Just use Bob because it doesn't matter if you say compartmentalization. He's like, oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, because that, that's what he focused on was like some of the. Uh, can't say what he folks on it would be really easy to find out who he is. But um, you'd be able to, to that, that he worked on compartmentalization in certain parts of the cell and stuff. And so, you know, they're up there and they can, because they can, in Michigan at least, and they do, they can just ask you literally anything in science. They want to, you know, you give your spiel and stuff. And so I got this question, so why do you suppose, I don't remember now what it was, but uh, why do you suppose that the, something like that the RNAs P, so I worked on Robin Nucleus P, in Prokaryotes, like humans, is so highly um, evolved in the fact that it has an RNA component and it has you know, at least 8 to 10 protein subunits and they're all required for catalysis, except then you've got the prokaryotic that you can take all of, it's only got one little protein and one big RNA and you can take away the protein in vitro and it's got catalysis and stuff and I was like, what's well, due to the hierarchy of the compartmentalization of the cell? And I was like, ah, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. They were right, and so I passed. So... <laughs> So yeah, that's word for the wise. Find out all the gossip, just like there's one in there that said, you do not want her on your committee. She's horrible. She deliberately will make you squirm. And so, yeah. But we have our monomers here. Once again, they left the lipids out, sort of. The lipids are here at one point. Where, where are the lipids, if you just look at this? They just kind of snuck them in there. Plasma membrane, <laughs> and so that's why the proteins are floating in a sea of. That's when we get to be a little groovy ourselves. That's later this semester. And then talk about the fluid mosaic model. But we have, for example, the nucleotides, which go on to make the macromolecule of DNA or an RNA, and, and you're going to find out specialized nu nucleic acids to form chromatin in one example, and then ultimately it gets packaged and put in here. What they're showing is it gets put into the nucleolus. But... Um, there are other, other parts of the cell that actually have DNA and RNA. What, what other part of the cell has its own DNA and RNA? Mitochondria, Mitochondria has some. Okay. And, and chloroplast in plants, I should say. All right, and then likewise, we can have the amino acids forming proteins. Then they just kind of snuck it in there. There's lipids and other things that get in, in carbohydrates that matter that get put together into the supramolecular complex of the <laughs> plasma membrane and the other um, um, fluid membranes. 
and then you know can, can be ultimately put into the cell with its organelles. And likewise, we have sugars forming in this instance here cellulose to form the cell wall in plants, and then going to form the outer tough shell of the, the cell. And of course, we don't have a cell wall. Whoops. All right. And so, which came first of the biomolecules? And you know, that's sort of like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which, what is the answer? Does anyone know? What, what, what would be the biblical answer? The chicken. No. Yeah, I mean, most likely. Who knows? But I guess Adam does. So, faith integration. I have to really work. Especially in organic chemistry, I have to work hard for faith integration. In biochem is a little easier to see. So. All right. So, there's catalytic activity that's associated with proteins. Or the coating that's associated with nucleic acids. Okay. And then, it says it's discovered recently, but... It's discovered recently. Recently is kind of relative. Recently for me, but maybe not recently for you, because we're talking like the 1970s. So, <laughs> relatively recently, it was discovered that certain types of RNAs actually are capable of doing catalysis on their own. They can process themselves, and some of them were actually used to do other types of things. And so, that's where they had this whole idea that RNA, most likely, especially if you, and I have to say that in vitro, they can do what's called CLEX to form um, these to, to like weed out and make these RNAs that can catalyze themselves, so it's the evidence that they use, um, to be the original biomolecule. And so, and it actually still has some function in like the hepatitis delta virus and things like that, that um, you utilize these RNAs that self-code themselves and they cut themselves out and all that, which is something similar to what I worked on, but that came up with this whole idea of RNA and that it was able to form its own replication, but it just wasn't very good at it. And so then ultimately, you got DNA, and then DNA formed, was able to make the protein, and so on and so forth. But that's called the RNA world hypothesis. Okay? And that's about the extent that I was going to talk about the RNA world hypothesis. <clears throat> All right. And then we have prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which, what is a prokaryote? A single-celled organism. And so what are some examples? Bacteria. What's another example? What? Someone said it, I think. The archaea, also called archaebacteria, and cyanobacteria, which is kind of like a cheating way of saying bacteria, I think. But I'm not a microbiologist. To me, they are all about the same. But they do say eubacteria versus archaebacteria, the newer bacteria versus the ancient. And they're all old. So, all right. And then the eukaryotes, what makes a eukaryote different? Do they have to be multiple cells? No, not necessarily. What is... They have the mem a membrane and membrane bound, like nucleus or, or yes. So when it went from one version of PowerPoint to the next, it did everything backwards. So, okay. So it has a well-defined nucleus with the nuclear membrane. Okay, it can be single-celled, like yeast, or it can be multicellular. Right. And at this point in time, I would expect you to know the different organelles, and if they're in prokaryotes or eukaryotes. Right, so, for example, we've already discussed the fact that the prokaryotes have no nucleus versus the eukaryotes. That's what makes them a eukaryote. They both have some type of cell membrane. Do they have the same cell membrane? No. It's going to have different composition. Do you have the same cell membrane throughout your body? No, we're going to find out it's very different compositions between them. You know, they may have some of the same components, but they're going to be in different <coughs> parts. Um, like, what's one part of your body that has a highly proteinaceous cell membrane? There's one part of your body that, I mean, it's just chock full of proteins and relative to the amount of lipids. Mm, well, no, I mean, I should say it's actually a part of the cell, so it's in actually multiple parts of your body. <laughs> It's the mitochondria. What is it about the mitochondria that has to have so much protein in its own membrane? What happens there? 
Electron transport chains is highly proteinaceous, and so that's why, I mean, it's like 55% of the inner membrane is like protein or something like that. It's something ridiculous. Whereas there are certain parts of your body that is highly, highly lipid, like your adipose tissue. <clears throat> okay. And so the cell membrane, there are cell membranes, but they aren't kind of the same. The mitochondria, there's no mitochondria per se in the prokaryote because they do their oxidation on their membrane themselves. And so there's something, for example, when we do that's on transport chain next semester is something called the Animox bacteria that have something very similar, except what's really cool is they don't do it with oxygen. It's nitrogen-based, and they actually make rocket fuel. This, I think, is cool, because I just can imagine, like, some... Well, no, I won't, because if I say it, it'd probably end up on some, like, no-fly list. But the Animox bacteria, because they found it, like, in certain, you know, in anaerobic conditions, since it doesn't have oxygen, and so they're literally... They don't release rocket fuel, but it's one of the intermediates there. <clears throat> All right, so if you think that they found it like in dung heaps and things like that, so talk about explosive diarrhea. <laughs> but a thing. All right, I'll be here all week, people. Well, not next week, at least. I will next week. So there's no ER in the prokaryotes. Of course, we have ER. Ribosomes are present in both. And then chloroplasts are in, well, obviously, green plants, but not in us. And they don't have chloroplasts. Instead, they have what's called chromatophores because they, they don't have the internal membrane um, of a chloroplast. Because <coughs> the whole idea of the endosymbiotic um, relationship where the evolutionists say that you know, a eukaryotic organism engulfed the bacteria that became the chloroplast or that became the mitochondria. And then this is just, I would expect you to know these, um, the fact of what they are and what they do. So I'm not going to go into greater detail. And then this is just what it looks like in the animal cell. I do want to point out some, because I don't know how much detail they go into some of these, but uh, later on this semester we'll talk a little bit more. Like, do they go over, like, the nucleolus? What is the nucleolus? Besides, it says ribosomal RNA synthesis, but it's barely touching it. But what is what makes the nucleus separate? Does it have a membrane? No. And so it's like they don't have the call bodies in there. So what is a nucleus? Like, how do they know it exists? Oh, I mean, yes, chromatin is like their RNA molecules and the proteins also that are get in there, and they just they, this is condensed. And so you can kind of think of it as being like a metropolitan area. Like then let's say, you know, Tampa Bay, but that's more than just Tampa. The city limits Tampa. And so, yeah, it's a really highly condensed area within the nucleus. The nucleus itself does have a membrane, of course, but it is highly condensed. And then there's some cell biologists who argue amongst themselves of whether it's the call bodies and some of the other compartmentalization within the nucleus even really exists, like, or is it just a figment of their imagination? But I'll let them duke that one out. <clears throat> All right. We have the three domains. Actually, I've already talked about it. We have the archaea bacteria, e bacteria, eukaryotes. They have, this is actually really outdated now, they have lots of genomes that have been obtained from each of these, and, you know, that's all that I'm going to say. I, that will probably be the extent of ever me discussing of archaea bacteria versus eubacteria bacteria for this course, because this isn't a microbiology course. Um, actually, I want to skip this slide. All right, so where does the energy originate? This is just an example utilizing something like ATP. But we have to do, and we actually go into great detail next semester, at the very beginning of next semester, um, on where we get our energy in the sense that we actually get it from potential energy, primarily from the environment, things like the sun, right? And we have to do, we are, we are like little transducers, where we convert energy from one form in order to get it to do mechanical work, okay? Which is really cool. It's really obvious whenever we look at something like the electron transport chain, which literally has little turnstiles. That's how that makes ATP. The protons that get rushed out, they have to go, they're forced to go through the little turnstile of ATP synthase, and it literally crams and smacks a phosphate into ADP to make ATP, where it's like you're going you're gonna to force it in there. And so um, which is, it's, really, it's really cool the way that it works. And so we have to have the potential energy, either chemical potential energy or, or even energy from the light, that whole thing from physics where 
E equals H nu, that kind of thing. Um, and we, we use some type of energy transduction to get us to do mechanical work and other chemical work to physically make something because we actually have to violate the second law of thermodynamics, or I shouldn't say we violate it, we apparently violate the second law of thermodynamics because we decrease entropy by forming something that's more highly, highly complex. So the idea of entropy, I mean, the idea of the second law of thermodynamics is that entropy is always increasing, but it's an apparent violation whenever you have something like all these little nucleotides that you're forcing together to make a big piece of DNA. And the way that we do that is because you have to put in the energy of that system. Okay. And once again, that's this little touch, a little piece that we'll go into greater detail next semester. This is just showing ATP and the fact that you get energy by breaking it apart. And so it's, I could say that it's sort of like the energy currency. That it's not the only one, and it's not even the best. It's <coughs> sort of like the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar is a great currency internationally. It's not the best. Why, don't, why doesn't everything use, like, say, the euro or something that, or the Swiss franc, which is worth, like, you know, like a zillion dollars usually? What would be the problem with that? It would be how do you convert to get, I mean, it's hard to make whatever happens. Like, for example, PEP, which is fossil enopyruvate, it's worth almost twice the amount of ATP. But it's how would you go to make it? You'd have to put so much resources into making it that... Um, uh, it, it'd be too difficult, it'd be too expensive to make it in order just to use it. Whereas if you use AT, which you get a lot of energy out of, but you can, there are ways to make it. You, it doesn't take as much energy to make it as well. Okay, that's sort of like economics, what, integration instead of faith integration. <clears throat> and so this is just mechanical energy. And I would expect you to know what free energy is, like Delta gives free energy. And so if it's positive, that means it's being done on the object, whereas it, if it's negative, it's being given off. So it's endergonic, or you have to put energy into it to make ATP, but when ATP is broken down, you get the energy out. And so what happens is this is just an example from Jen Ken. And this one, does anyone know where this occurs? This is glucose making glucose 6-phosphate, <coughs> which is definitely you have to add energy in. But what metabolic pathway utilizes this? It's not a citric acid cycle. It's close. This is glycolysis. This is the first step in, gl in glycolysis. And there, in, in vivo, we actually have another way of doing it. We have an enzyme called hexokinase that does it for us. But it's very, very, you have to add lots and lots of energy in order to make glucose 6-phosphate. You can get a lot more energy out of it by breaking it. But the way that they do it is if you couple it, this is called coupling, if you couple it to the breaking apart of ATP, when you add those two together, you get an overall delta G that's, that's more negative, okay? And so that's why, yes, you have to add in so much energy in order to form it, but you get more energy <coughs> out of breaking the ATP. So what happens is the enzyme first breaks ATP, becomes phosphorylated, and then it transfers the phosphate over to glucose. <coughs> And that brings us to enzymes, which, now your current book does a much better job, but it, usually in general biology, a lot of times you say enzymes are proteins that, you know, perform catalysis, that do chemical reactions, right? And that its effectiveness is based on its amino acid sequence and things like that. But is that, are all enzymes really proteins? No. There are not enzymes that are made that, that where RNA does the work and does the catalysis, and the proteins are just ancillary. They're auxiliary proteins. What's one example of that? There's one major example that even biologists used to kind of like, uh, wash over. They didn't believe until actually, actually the person won the Nobel Prize for it. But actually, there have been two people that have won, two different groups of people that have won Nobel Prizes for looking at RNAs that did catalysis. What's one of them? That's a major, major player in your body. It even has like it in the name that it uses RNA. What? RNAs. Well, RNA just means it breaks apart RNA. <coughs> what is RNAs P, which it is a player in tRNA maturation without you die. But um, there's another one that, that usually you do learn in the whole little little um, 
that was the central dogma of, of molecular biology slash biochemistry. The ribosome. Ribosome, what does ribosome do? Or what do ribosomes do? Make proteins. And it's made up of R RNAs and ribosomal proteins, and it's the R RNAs that actually do the catalysis. The proteins are just kind of holding things in together and help it do something. And so, but yep, it's nucleotides that do that. Oh, come on now. And then there's the genetic code. And this brings us up to the whole idea of, I've actually already mentioned it. Let me just do it. It's called the central dogma. And at this point in time, you should know what that is. In the, and that's what we're going to end with. And the idea that you have DNA. And DNA goes on to make RNA. And it is, back, it is reciprocal RNA. And that process was called transcription, which I'm just going to abbreviate TXN. DNA is also used to make itself, which that's that process called, that's replication, which I'm just going to, for time's sake, put RAP, but that's replication. RNA can go backwards in certain organisms and at certain times to make DNA, and that's called reverse transcription. That's the easy one to remember. Then RNA goes on to make proteins via the ribosomes in translation. And of course, then proteins and RNAs for some go on to do the, the action. And some people would even have it go, oh, go on, make DNA. But you know, with, with, the, with the whole idea of the poly, uh, poly, polymerases and things like that. Okay, and so that's that, the, the whole idea of the molecular, sometimes, sometimes it's called the central dogma of molecular biology, sometimes called the central dogma of biochemistry. They really kind of go hand in hand. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and.